Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications. Cheers. Welcome, everybody. Cheers. Good yeah, time. dry January. Cindy and I did not make the finished wine. I mean, line, as you can tell. <laughs> I, I never even started that race. I don't know about you. I just, I think that's a waste of good wine. So exactly. What are you drinking today? You know, today I went a little different because it's winter. It's a little chilly. So um, I have apple cider tea with some brandy on top and it Ooh. is, it's nice and, and warm. What about you? cold there? Are yeah. you chilly? Yeah, it's a little chilly going into the, it's going to go into the 20s tomorrow. So um, yeah, definitely an indoor day. Well, I'm drinking a delicious Chardonnay because I'm in sunny Florida and it's still sunny. And a lot of people think it's chilly when it got down to 50 last night. The horror. But I'm still, I thought it was rather beautiful. <laughs> oh, you can always see the, the natives versus the snowbirds. The natives at this time in Florida, they've got the parkas on and the snowbirds <laughs> Like, oh my God, there's no snow, you know. It's That's so perfect. true. Yeah. Oh my gosh, no one's on the beach. It's only 70. <laughs> <laughs> well, our guest is probably a little chilly today. She is Samantha Woodruff and she's in Connecticut. She writes historical fiction, which we all love. Cindy got me hooked on it. Mm -hmm. Samantha has a BA in history from Wesley and she's got an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. She's worked at MTV. Nickelodeon. She's taught yoga. And then when she was taking a writing class, she just found her passion. She loves writing. And her first novel is already getting rave reviews. It's one of those Amazon first reads where they recommend it and you can get it. And people are loving it. It's The Lobotomist's Wife. So we raise a glass and welcome Samantha Woodruff to Prose. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. So happy to be here. So what you drinking? I am drinking Chardonnay as well, in spite of the fact that it is cold outside. And we had a non-snow snow day today. But, um, I, I, you know, I'm still feeling the white wine. So here we are. Absolutely. Now, when, you, when the book comes out officially, a lot of the authors say it's champagne only. You just start popping the corks. <laughs> I don't know. I for me it might be tequila. We'll see. <laughs> oh my! She gets like here. She'll start the book with some tequila and then you know, yeah, warm it up. <laughs> I don't know. Supply chain issues might be impacting that. We, there's a shortage of short, of uh, the bubbly. So yes, true. Yes, there's supply chain issues all, all over the place. We'll see if my a book true comes sign out of the apocalypse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no bubbly and the books are delayed. Well, book is not delayed. We're still we're still crossing our fingers for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hoping. Hoping hoping. February first. Well, yeah. tell us a little bit how you got into historical fiction and then tell us a little bit about the book. Okay. So um, as you said, I studied history in college and then I went a totally different way. For a second, I actually thought I was gonna go and get a PhD in history. Um and I really wanted to do that because I wanted to somehow do something with history and popular culture. And then I just ended up working in popular culture and working in TV for years. And so I started reading a lot of historical fiction and I've always loved that mix of feeling like you're in a world and learning something while being entertained, right? It's like takes the study and the work out of studying history. You just get to be told a story and feel like you're there. Um, so as a lover of historical fiction, it when I finally came around to trying to write a book, it's made sense to write historical fiction, but that wasn't where I started. I actually was toying with a contemporary novel about a woman who was basically me. Um, not me, but me, which is, you know, the, the author's way, I think, from I've come to understand. We're always in our stories, even if we think we're not. Um, and so I was writing a story about a suburban housewife who was unhappy and was acting out in a variety of ways because she didn't feel fulfilled in her life. At the same time, I was reading, a non actually listening on Audible to a nonfiction book 
uh, called Get Well Soon. And it was a history book and it was, but it was a popular history book. So it was sort of like light and fun, as light as it can be when the book is about the world's greatest plagues and the people who fought them. That's what the book was about. <laughs> it's fantastic actually, and it's very entertaining. But within this book that was about real plagues, she also had a chapter on lobotomy and specifically a man named Walter Freeman who popularized lobotomy in the United States. He brought it to the United States and then invented the ice pick lobotomy, which is like the 10 minute office outpatient procedure version of lobotomy. Oh my gosh. Um, I knew really nothing about lobotomy before listening to this chapter of the book. And he, as she's telling this, the story of lobotomy, she mentioned Rosemary Kennedy was one of the, yeah. um, mm -hmm. the victims of the lobotomist. She also sort of talked about how many of his subjects were women and it was the late 40s and early 1950s when this was going on. And all of a sudden, I just had this moment where I said, oh, my God, like that just seems like yesterday. Right. That's not that long ago. Yeah. And what if this dissatisfied housewife that I'm writing about lived in the 1950s and was experiencing this and a time when her husband could basically decide to have her lobotomized? And that was the seed of my story. And from there, I just ditched the contemporary novel and dove in on the other side to wow. start researching. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you find? I mean, is it true? I think I've read stories that when women, like say, just had hormonal issues, their husbands or doctors would think they were hysterical or whatever and would and possibly make them candidates for lobotomy. Is that all yes. true in your so there is a, I mean, lobotomy originated as a treatment for severe psychosis, like extreme mental illness. And when Walter Freeman first popularized it in the United States, it was really to alleviate the burden of the state because there were all these violent psychotics in asylums and asylums were, the conditions in asylums were worse than conditions in prisons in the 1930s. And he thought there had to be a better way to help he really was trying to help people, to help people. But over time, he started to broaden and broaden his understanding of what the indications for lobotomy could be. And he started to see it as an earlier intervention. And that was also around the time that he took it from a brain surgery in a hospital to something that he could perform on his own. He was not a surgeon in his office. And it was then that it really morphed into something that could, he was performing lobotomies from what I understand and from what I've read for headaches, like migraine headaches, for <laughs> postpartum depression. Um, there's a, a, a man who survived his lobotomy who is an adult now named Howard Dully, and there's been a lot of stuff. He wrote a book called My Lobotomy, and NPR did something on him, and and he was lobotomized as a child by his stepmother had him brought to Walter Freeman because he wasn't well behaved. He was acting out because his mom, I think, had died. And they thought lobotomy would be a good solution. What doctor would think that was a good idea? Right. So there, I became fascinated by this idea of where that line crosses, right? Like, how can you start with such good intentions and get to a place where you think that you should like permanently essentially disable someone for a migraine headache or for not being a good kid? Like, I mean, it's pretty extreme. Um, and so the story from there, the story of the lobotomist's wife was a girlfriend of mine who is a writer, Susie Schnall. She's terrific historical fiction writer and also contemporary fiction. Um, she, I was telling her about the book, the idea, and she said, did this guy have a wife? Who was she? What, what was she like? And I started to think, God, who could be married to a guy that was doing this? And the real life lobotomist ha was not only married, but had four children. And so I started to research his wife because then I got really fascinated by this idea of like, who's standing by the man that's doing this to so many people, but especially like women and children. Um, and she wasn't who I imagined at all. 
And from there, the book became The Lobotomist's Wife, because then I invented a different wife that was the wife I thought he should have, and, um, and sort of built the story around that. So it is a story, when you get to read the book, it's a story of, it's really a story of two women. There's a, Margaret is a 1950s housewife suffering from postpartum depression, who eventually becomes a patient of the lobotomists. And Ruth is the lobotomist's wife, who is an American heiress who has devoted her life to taking care of the mentally ill and becomes enamored both with the lobotomist himself and with lobotomy because she really believes it's a miracle cure. So she, and we go on the journey of understanding where lobotomy started and where it ended up through Ruth's lens, basically. It's, it's close third person, it's not a first person narrative, but she's the protagonist of the story and she takes us along the ride. And eventually she and uh, Margaret's paths cross and then, then the book becomes like a, almost a thriller. Like you, you just, that's what I've heard. People can't put it down at that point, so. Yeah. <laughs> Is it going to give me nightmares? I don't think so. It's not it. You know, I, what I what I think and there's a little creepiness. I mean, lobotomy is creepy and there's a couple of scenes where there is there's one scene where lobotomy is performed. That's like I that is a fictionalization of the scene that got me interested in this topic in the first place from Get Well Soon. Um, and without spoiling anything, Walter Freeman went to the hotel room of a man who had a court ordered lobotomy and hadn't shown up and decided to just lobotomize him in the hotel room. So, and that's true. In fact, and he filed an insurance claim after the fact. <laughs> For his travel time too, like this is a home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Time and materials. So I was I was about to ask you what's the most disturbing thing that that you uncovered from from Friedman and his his wife, but that sounds pretty pretty high up there. So is there something well, worse? Friedman, so so Friedman and his wife's history really really diverged from what I've written in the book. They um, she was an economics professor, and they married young. And they really had a very estranged marriage. And he he actually, like, they tragically lost one of their kids. He was, Walter Freeman himself was like a, a big outdoorsman. So he was very, from the biography that I read and from everything I've read about him, he was incredibly focused. He didn't need much sleep. He worked all the time. And when he wasn't doing that, he wanted to be out in the outdoors. So he would hike and he would drive cross country. Eventually, um, he would drive cross country lobotomizing people. But e even before he had his camper van that legend says he called a lobotomobile, which is not true, um, but it is a great idea. I think, and I, did, I kept it in the book. Um, he would go on like long camping trips and hikes with his family. And he was on one hike with one of his sons, one of his four kids and the son was reaching to get something like into a stream and waterfall and fell and died. And Freeman watched this happen, the wife wasn't there. But that was really kind of, in his life, that was the moment that set him on a trajectory, I think, kind of of obsession with lobotomy and his career and his, because he just got lost in his work. Um, <laughs> I didn't tell that story at all because the what I was looking to do is is use lobotomy and the idea of it as a vehicle to look at women's roles in society and the things the lengths that people will go to to fit in and really be, you know um, fit society's norms when you're not necessarily feeling it. So, so that was my angle, and I didn't want to get down a rabbit hole of the loss of a child. I could write a second book about that. That would be another interesting <laughs> book, but um, that wasn't where I went. So, now in your research, did you find that Freeman and his 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 wife kind of came full circle, and and clearly that's not going to be a, a, a where your book went, but did they come full circle and, and realize what they did was wrong? And, no. So, well, Freeman's wife was 
very uninvolved from what I could tell. There was very little written about her. Her name was Marjorie. Um, he was a philanderer. He had lots of affairs. He was very disconnected, I think, as he got older from his wife and family life and family obligations. Although his kids, he, he, I mean, one of his kids became a doctor. He has a junior, there's a, there's a, he's Walter Freeman the second. And then there's a, his son is, is a junior, even though it should be a tray, I guess. Um, but Freeman was lobotomizing people. And this is very different from how my book ends. So this is one area where I really went, leaned in on the fiction. Freeman was lobotomizing people until the nut, late 1960s. And what happened is that in the mid 50s, Thorazine became popular and all of a sudden there was a drug, a pill that they could use to treat psychosis that was not a surgery and was not permanent and was much easier and anyone could administer it. And lobotomy fell out of favor. And the evidence then, there was also enough evidence to see that lobotomy wasn't necessarily doing great things. It was leaving people like as vegetables. It was leaving them incontinent. I mean, it, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, Rosemary Kennedy probably being the most famous. She went from being, from what I've read, sort of difficult and moody and maybe developmentally disabled to not being able to go to the bathroom by herself or like write her own name um, because of her lobotomy. So, um, but Freeman still believed in it. So he was he had been in Washington, D.C. for most of his career. He moved to California and he was sort of performing lobotomies here and there. And ultimately, he killed somebody. It was, I think, the third lobotomy he was performing on this woman. And she had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. Um, that was his other thing. He believed in it so much that if the first one didn't work, he'd go back in and do another Oh my God. Sorry, that yes. didn't fix it. Let me take a little yes. wrong, wrong chunk. Yes. And he and he then, um, so at that point he lost his license, but he spent the rest of his life traveling the country again, seeing old mm -hmm. patients. He really believed he 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 was myopic. I mean, he and probably somewhat mentally ill himself because he couldn't see the damage. All he saw was the benefit. He kept yeah. all of the Christmas cards and thank you notes from all his patients. He really thought he had saved them. And that's what he did until he died was like visit them, basically. Now, isn't like the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Next with um, Jack Nicholson? Didn't that what they they performed that on him, right? Yes. I guess I spoiled it if anybody hasn't seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that shows to me what a horrible procedure that is. Yes. And but at that point, so that. Interestingly, February 1st, when my book comes out, is the 60th anniversary of the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo, the release of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest <laughs> by Ken. Get Cuckoo. out! No, I swear. And the movie is about 40 years old. But so um, by the time that book was written, lobotomy had been vilified in society. Like it was the punchline to a joke. It was, it was a horror. But in the real time that it was happening, that was something, and I'm not saying that there weren't sadistic nurses and doctors who just wanted to control their mentally ill patients, but there was a moment when they really thought this was good, this was helpful, this was making people calm who otherwise would have had to be strapped up and left to rot. And now they could sometimes go home and be with their families. Mm -hmm. They couldn't talk. They couldn't necessarily go to the bathroom on their own, but they could be in their out. They were out of the institution. And so that was seen as progress. And not wow. a danger, you know, likely not right. a danger. Right. But well, because they, they were in a way, if you I mean, if you really want to get into like the, the the way society thinks about the mentally ill, thought about the mentally ill, they were lost one way or another. So at least this way, they're lost and easier to deal with was the thinking. Wow. Yeah. It's not nice. <laughs> it's so interesting to see the evolution, like look back, you know, and, and just see that evolution of thought process and go, how did we ever start there? But yeah. You, you mentioned earlier that, that you wanted to highlight, you know, women's roles and, and how, you know, they can play into a supportive role or, 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 or change things. What is it that you hoped to, to really shine a light on in, in this book um, from that perspective? So um, 
when I was writing this book, it was sort of the height of the Me Too movement. And I had this feeling that the story that I was telling and that I was imagining in my brain was just another iteration of the ways in which women felt subjugated and pigeonholed and were finally acting out and talking about it during Me Too. That, so Ruth Emeraldine, the, the lobotomist's wife, is the head of a mental hospital in the 1930s through the 1950s. And that was very unusual. And I, and she, she's a very independent woman. She's an American heiress who doesn't um, care about her family's wealth. She only cares about it to the extent that it enables her to do what she wants to do, what she's passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and so exploring that and then but yet she still ends up supporting this man and this treatment that is really, you know, ultimately pretty barbaric and kind of punitive. And, um, and so that dynamic of how you can be strong and powerful, but still make choices that come from what society expects of you on some level. It, it, it's subtle, but that's sort of where I was going there. And then you have Margaret, who is, uh, you know, a housewife who's supposed to be happy and, first of all, has a diagnosable illness that was not diagnosed. I mean, they called it baby blues and they said, take a few hours of sleep and you'll be fine. Um, and so she's got that. And she, she, all she wants in life is to be the wife and mother and the perfect um, homemaker that she's supposed to be, and she can't get there. And she's desperate to get there. So the message I hope readers take away from the book is it's okay to just be. It's okay to just be who you are. None of us are perfect. None of us are going to get there. There's going to be expectations, and society is going to say this, that, and the other. But just kind of living in your own skin is the best way to get through life as opposed to, you know, lobotomy. <laughs> I'll drink to that. Yeah, right, I will too. <laughs> Cheers, yeah, definitely. What are you working on now? Well, I am in the very early stages of research on a book that is another historical fiction. Um, I will tell you, I in the last few months, I've read the three most recent books by Taylor Jenkins Reid, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones and the Six and Malibu Rising. And I think she's incredible. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, should I try and write something contemporary or like more contemporary? Because could I ever do what she does? But I don't think I could. Um, I'm not comparing myself to her in any way. I just was so inspired by how well she did what she did. Um, but I'm in the 1920s and um, the story that I'm working on, and I literally have written a hundred words. I'm just doing research right now and really trying to let the story frame itself is again about something that people probably didn't know that much about. It's about short selling the stock market when during the crash of the Great Depression. Mm. And it's a story of two twins, a woman, a female and a male. And she's like a math and stock genius. And he's an incredible salesman. And she sort of becomes the woman behind the man. And he becomes this great investor and stock market legend. And um, so, but there's a lot of different elements. They're Jewish immigrant family. And they lost everything when they came to America. And then they're both self-made. And so it should be a lot of fun. It's daunting to write about the 20s because it's so known and written about and adored, but I'm going to try. I figure if I have this financial angle, then it'll like make it a little different. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be great. Thank you. <laughs> the book is The Lobotomist's Wife, and it's due out February 1st, but you can get it right now at Amazon.com, right? Yes. In, on your Kindle. On your Kindle. Yes. And hopefully you're going to get it and have book tours and you'll be back with the the new book, when do you think that one's going to come out? Next year or this year? No way. <laughs> 24, 2024, maybe? Oh, really? Okay. It takes so a lot, lot of research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show with us. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Cheers, ladies. Join us next week for another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications.